Good morning, everyone. It's good to see uh, all of you this morning, uh, members of the diplomatic corps, U.S. government officials, representatives from the United Nations and affiliate organizations, uh, NGOs, uh, distinguished guests, and of course, the people who come for the 21st year to the annual Brain Trust Friends of Africa. And we are so pleased uh, to have you here at the 209th CBCF Foreign Affairs Brain Trust on Africa. And we've been very pleased over the course of the years to have a constituency, a, a very uh, important and interested and, and, and dedicated individuals who come each year. And many of the accomplishments that we've been able to do uh, for the 21 years that I've been uh, championing this cause has been because of the participation of individuals who come year in and year out, persons who have sat in audiences and have then become presidents of countries, persons who were here and imprisoned in their country and we advocated for their release and they uh, were and in places became heads of those same states that had imprisoned them and hundreds and millions of people who have benefited from food assistance and economic development and conflict resolution training by virtue of people who actually came to this brain trust and went back home here domestically in the United States, but back to their countries, inspired to say that we can make a change. And so I'm always very pleased uh, to see our friends each year. And of course, the important thing is that we must continue to have new friends uh, as we see here this morning. We will convene the Brain Trust on Africa this year as we usually do to take the temperature of U.S.-African relations. This year's uh, session is entitled Africa in the Age of Obama, U.S. Policy, Democratization, and, weather and Weathering the Economic Storm. Democra democratization and Weathering the Economic Storm. And as we know, as Africa was showing growth in their GDP, when the economic crisis came, you know what it did to the United States of America. You can just imagine what it did to developing countries when the price of fuel went skyrocketing uh, to several, four dollars a barrel from uh, 100. Uh, it stopped the engines of progress in uh, African countries. Uh, and so we have to see how we can weather this economic storm. One year ago, the Brain Trust explored the opportunities and challenges for the next administration at a time when we did not know in September of last year who would become the President of the United States. Today, as we discuss the state of the continent and its relationships with the United States, President Barack Hussein Obama today alone uh, is doing more in one week than many presidents have done in their entire term. He will be leading, the, he led the discussion just last night, uh, several days ago at the G20 summit in Pittsburgh. Our president has had a busy week, as I mentioned, Wednesday. It's his first appearance as president of the United States uh, before the 64th General Assembly. After the G General Assembly, he attended the uh, climate change conference and chaired a meeting of the Security Council. This is the first time in the history of the United Nations that an American president had chaired a meeting of the Security Council. All of this just in this week. President Obama also hosted a luncheon for African heads of state. And Secretary, our ambassador to the UN, Susan Rice, attended. And we're so pleased that, for example, the United States has rejoined uh, the Human Rights Commission in Geneva, where we've been off for, for decades. So many changes have been happening, uh, so many that we don't even note them. Uh, and 
Secretary Rice described the meeting on how the United States can work in partnership with African governments to strengthen African economies and African development. It is not unprecedented for the United States presidents to meet with African leaders. We've seen many presidents do that uh, over the years. But to have 25 heads of state meet with a president of the United States at one time is really something that uh, we, we marvel at. And it was the largest of such gathering ever achieved. As a matter of fact, perhaps that one meeting, the President of the United States met with more African heads of states than presidents have done in their entire terms of four years and eight years. And so we've had so many significant uh, things happen this week with our President Barack Obama and the continent of Africa. In the meeting, President Obama said, a prosperous and peaceful Africa is vital to the United States and the world. More importantly, though, he made a point of listening to leaders' priorities and concerns, which, of course, is a little bit different from a president of the United States, even from almost anyone from the United States to listen. Uh, we're usually telling, right? So this was very, very unique and important. Liberian President Johnson Sirleaf spoke about providing jobs for the growing youth population. Same problem we have here. They have the problem there just many, many times folded. Rwanda's President Kugami spoke about trade and investment as he's wiring his country for the new millennium. President of Tanzania, President Kiweti, uh, talked about using agriculture as a means for economic development. And we have seen departments of the United States that have never been as engaged as they are today. The Department of Commerce is working very diligently. We had people from the Department of Transportation in Africa now talking about infrastructure and if we're ever going to have economic growth. The Department of Agriculture has taken a tremendous giant leap uh, to deal with Africa. And so we have departments of the United States of America that basically dealt with domestic issues are now on the continent, seeing how uh, they can assist in the growth and development in an integrated way. I accompanied Secretary of State Hillary Clinton on her first, on the first half of her seven nation 11 day tour. Certainly, she met with leaders of Kenya, South Africa, Angola, the DRC, Nigeria, Liberia, and Cape Verde. It's quite significant that the Secretary of State would spend so much time traveling in Africa, and I believe it's certainly, once again, the longest trip of a Secretary of State of the United States of America to Africa in the history of our country. Seven countries, 11 days. It was grueling. I was uh, on it, as I mentioned, for the first half of the trip, and uh, she really did an outstanding and fantastic job from meeting in fields and agriculture, meeting with women uh, who had been victims of rape, meeting with children, meeting at HIV, um, and uh, uh, victims uh, talking to heads of state, talking to opposition leaders, going to town hall meetings. It was uh, amazing. The administration faces key challenges in Somalia, where the fledging transitional federal government, the TFG led by Sheikh Sharif Sheikh Hamid, struggles to fight off al-Shabaab and other insurgents intent on seeing lawlessness and destruction of Somalia. Secretary Clinton, while we were in Nairobi, met with President Sheikh Sharif uh, in August when we were there. Uh, I recommended that we have that meeting, as you know, I've been trying to get attention to Somalia ever since the, the U.S. withdrew in the 90s. I didn't know I would finally get the attention by them trying to shoot me down, but <laughs> since it happened, I figured let me make, take advantage of it since this time they missed, uh, and we really were able to focus the attention that I've been trying to get for, for decades. Uh, 
The administration has taken a new approach to Somalia, an approach of engagement for long-term stability and development. I commend the administration for its support to the TFG and encourage more support, and which has certainly been pledged by Secretary Clinton. In the Democrat Republic of Congo, the war in the East fueled by mineral wealth continues to disproportionately affect women and children, the most vulnerable. This must come to an end. We cannot continue to allow this to occur. Something must stop this tragedy. The Ethiopian human rights and the Ethiopian human rights and democracy continues to be stifled by the administ or uh, by their administration and uh, the draconian laws and uh, the limits of activities of non-governmental organizations that have been uh, imposed by the president of uh, prime minister of that country. And accountability still is not yet applied to those responsible for the post-election violence in 2005 when dozens were killed by security forces and innocent Ethiopians were rounded up and detained for months and years. State-sponsored violence continues in the Ogaden region as we know that the people of Somali descent are being brutalized daily by the armed forces of Ethiopia. In Sudan, the Comprehensive Peace Agreement of 2005 is still unfulfilled as concerns grow over cartoons planned for elections scheduled next year and the referendum in 2011 when the people of the South will choose to remain as a part of Sudan or decide to form a new Sudan. Also, villages continue to be attacked in Darfur. As for the economic outlook, progress made by African nations toward growth and development are put at risk by the global economic downturn, as I mentioned earlier. And one other country that we uh, certainly uh, have had concerns about is Zimbabwe. Uh, we have seen somewhat of uh, improvement with the coalition government, Morgan Sangarai and MDC. Uh, however, uh, we are not seeing enough change. I did have the fortune to have a three-hour meeting with President Mugabe in Zimbabwe several months ago, and we think perhaps there could be a breakthrough, but uh, it's slow in coming but the educational system has to be reopened. Agriculture must start to develop again. A country that had so much growth and development potential has really gone to a halt. And so uh, I am still encouraged that we can turn that position, that country around. A report by the Organization of Economic Cooperation and Development and African Development Bank focused uh, forecast a 4.3 overall contraction of the GDP for African countries by the end of this year. This is a shift from the six to seven percent growth rates in countries like Botswana and Algeria were seeking. It's just a reversal. And at one point, African GDPs were going from six to 10 percent uh, 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 10, 15 years ago. Hiccups to democratic process have come in the form of recent flawed elections in the Republic of Congo and Gabon, and coups in Madagascar and Mauritania. Yet these are exceptions to the rule. In fact, Africa has made commendable progress over the last decade in a number of areas, including democracy and governance, and we will hear from our panelists on these and other issues. Again, the challenges facing the Obama administration in its Africa policy are great, yet there are so many points of light, and on a whole, the continent is moving forward towards greater stability, increasing democratization, and stronger economies. There are several key elements of the administration's approach to foreign policy that warrants mentioning before I introduce our opening speaker. The uh, administration is pursuing a comprehensive global health strategy, building on successes in the fight against HIV and AIDS, and working to end deaths from malaria, tuberculosis, and polio. I must commend former President Bush for launching the President's Emergency Plan for AIDS Relief, PEPFAR, originally a $15 billion program, which was tremendously higher than ever any period before in our country. But, uh, and then last year, 
uh, in his last year, we reauthorized the PEPFAR program to $48 billion over a five-year period. And as I indicated, we moved towards more attention to malaria and tuberculosis with the multiple strain uh, difficult TB that's been emerging in Africa. But we certainly commend former President Bush for his cooperation as we moved that through the House and the Senate for his signature. But President Obama has uh, taken the $48 billion and has pledged an additional $4 billion to PEPFAR, making it now a $52 billion program, but also uh, another $11 billion for global health strategies to improve um, many of the uh, diseases that have not been um, tropical diseases that have not been attended to, especially that affect mothers and children. The Millennium Challenge Corporation, which will We'll hear from later on in our panel provides grants called compacts, countries that rule justly, invest in their people, and have open markets are the three basic criteria. Of course, you certainly have to have transparency, lack of corruption, all of those issues are important before the Millennium Challenge Corporation will give the compact. But we have seen a tremendous number of these, and we'll hear from uh, uh, the record in a few minutes. This program started under the Bush administration, but we say that it should continue. We hope it, it will continue strong uh, with actually over half the compacts of the MCA are in Africa. The administration is launching a global food security strategy largely focused on Africa and spurred by the world's biggest economies to agree to pledge a $20 billion amount in food security and assistance, which was done at the G8 summit in July in Italy. From President, uh, from President Obama's trip to, to Ghana, to Secretary Clinton's Seven uh, Nation Tour, to the African Leaders Luncheon just this week at the UN, to the new approach to assistance, the age of Obama, looks like it will be one of Africa's most significant periods. And we look at the fact that the United States uh, will have Africa as a pillar of its foreign policy. Africa's role on the world stage will only continue to loom larger, and this will be reflected in U.S. policy. The continent holds so much the world's wealth in natural resources from oil to diamonds to coal train. However, its greatest resource is the African people. I believe that the age of Obama in terms of U.S.-African relations will be the age of new partnerships to invest in Africa's people for a sustainable development of the continent. We uh, really, once again, appreciate all of you being here, and now we will go to our very exciting lineup of speakers. It sounds like introducing a, a all-star football team, you know, because we have so many stars uh, on our panel. Uh, they will touch on issues ranging from democracy and governance, Africa's economic outlook, conflict resolution, to the role of African media, changing Americans' perception of the content. All of these things will be uh, wove, woven into our discussion. I will only take a few points out of the uh, uh, speaker's bio. You have the full biographical text with you, uh, and so I won't go through it thoroughly, but we will begin uh, by having opening remarks by two very distinguished people, uh, Ambassador Diakete and um, Dr. Janetta Cole. And let me begin by introducing our first speaker, Her Excellency, uh, Josefina Petra Diakite, Ambassador of the Republic of Angola. Ambassador has been the ambassador to the United States since 2001. Prior to coming to Washington, D.C., she served as the ambassador to the Scandinavian countries um, 
residing in the Kingdom of Sweden from 1993 to 2001. Uh, the ambassador has a long career in foreign service, which began as sec Secretariat for Cooperation from 1978 to 1990. Born in Lobito, uh, ambassador is fluent in Portuguese, French, and English. Good speaking and reading abilities in Spanish also. She is a forthright advocate for children and women and also has worked for conflict resolution issues in her career, has received many awards f for the, and recognition of her outstanding work. And she was extremely instrumental on my recent trip to Angola, uh, where she in, uh, ensured that I had a meeting with His Excellency President De Santos, and our trip was just outstanding. Uh, your Excellency. Thank you. Uh, good morning. Good morning. Everybody. Uh, let me start by thanking Congressman Donald Payne for your kind introduction and for your kind invitation also to have me participating today in this uh, event with some uh, opening remarks. Uh, excellencies, members of the Diplomatic Corps, distinguished guests and friends present here this morning, it is my honor and privilege to thank Congressman Donald Payne for extending me the invitation to deliver opening remarks at the Congressional Black Caucus Bains Trust on Africa. This is a very timely topic, Africa on the age of Obama. Before I make my remarks, I'd like to thank again Congressman Donald Payne, for its lifetime commitment to Africa on issues since struggles for liberation, in search for democracy and development, as well as an example of tireless engagement with my country, Angola, that uh, as the President José Eduardo dos Santos had the opportunity to say to Congressman Payne when he was in Angola, Congressman Payne was the one who taking our flag in Washington and in the Congress at very difficult times when Angola didn't have any bilateral relations with the United States. At that time, Angola was considered as a communist country. So Congressman Payne was very instrumental in terms of uh, influencing President Clinton to recognize Angola 16 years ago. The Bush administration and the Congress bipartisan commitment made great strides in Africa with its continuation with the President Clinton administration policies of programs such as AGOA, the launching of Millennium Challenge Account, the President Plan for AIDS Relief, PEPFAR, the President Malaria Initiative, among others. Congress support of expanding the trade relationships, paying attention to the danger of failing states and need to address the significant health threats and human rights concerns that still linger as derivative of the Cold War politics has ushered in the new era regarding to Africa policy, a legacy on which President Barack Obama is a craftly building. Ladies and gentlemen, 
President Obama is definitely cause of tremendous pride, not only for the United States, but for the entire world. The world is at a cultural, technical, political, socioeconomic, and economic, and uh, excuse me, historical cross, cross, crossroads, and should maximize this special momentum occasion to engage this visionary leader regarding on the nature of the economic, social, and the politi political challenge, and are facing not on, that not only Africa are facing, but all continents. At his speech during his first visit to Sub-Saharan Africa in Ghana, President Obama stressed, and I quote, I see Africa as a fundamental part of our interconnected world. As partners with American, on behalf of the future, we went for all our children. That partnership must be grounded in mutual responsibility and mutual respect. Cognizant the fact that the future of our continent depends on us, African countries have individually and collectively through regional bodies such as uh, African Union, New Ed, SADC, UN, SADC, ECOWAS, etc., take actions to this effect. So we enthusiastically acknowledge and welcome this mutual and collaborative uh, <coughs> cooperation statements. Thank you. The fact that uh, President Obama have taken the opportunity to visit Africa at uh, during his six months in office, and the fact that uh, two weeks after the, uh, his first visit, Pre uh, Secretary Clinton visited and other dignitaries of the United States visited also Africa is very significant. Secretary Clinton visited Kenya in the context of Agoa, visited South Africa, visited Angola, DRC, Nigeria, L Liberia, and Cape Verde. And uh, to all the countries she visited, she brought the message of friendship, engagement, and uh, partnership of the Obama administration. It is very significant since it is the first time that indeed one president of the United States took time at very early stage of his mandate and facing such uh, uh, daunting difficulties and challenges and he had in, was in, uh, on his country to visit uh, Africa. So we are very grateful with the, the message that the Secretary of State brought to, uh, to Africa and uh, of course especially to Angola. Secretary of State has said in Angola that uh, the United States are looking how to be friends, partners, and allies to Angola. We are grateful, grateful to that. It brings about a lot of challenges <laughs> to our part two in terms of meeting the past of uh, the uh, Th that the new administration is moving forward in terms of cooperation. I should underline that uh, during her visit, a part of meeting President uh, uh, Dos Santos, the President of National Assembly, to discuss how democracy is going on and also visit uh, uh, some uh, hospitals uh, 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 to, to find out uh, the situation of HIV AIDS uh, in, in Angola. Uh, uh, Secretary, <coughs> Secretary of State 
give instructions to her staff to start immediately some meetings in some areas. So showing really the interest of engagement in terms of helping uh, uh, Angola and uh, I'm sure Africa, other African uh, countries to uh, move forward. One of the, the areas that uh, both Secretary of State and the Congressman Penn discussed in Angola was, uh, of course, democracy. They were briefed about the movements that uh, the Angolan government has made towards the consolidation of its democracy by one side, but by the other side, the development that the country is going through just seven years after the end of the war. Today, Angola is having a new parliament and a new government that is really looking how to develop, how to, how to do the work that they were supposed to do during the time that the country was in war. So Secretary Clinton and uh, Congressman Payne, they had the opportunity to meet and visit the new Angola. The new Angola, which after seven years of uh, peace, is having hospitals for the majority of our people, is having schools all over the country, and is really looking how to develop, how to develop, the, how to improve the life of women and children, not only in rural areas, but also the integration of women in the, uh, in the, the government and in the political life of the country. As we speak, we have uh, about 30% of women in the government and 15% of women in the, in, the, in the parliament. So we are really grateful with the, the cooperation that we are already enjoying with this administration at such an early stage. Uh, as we speak, we already signed uh, uh, two agreements. We signed one TIF agreement in May, and the Secretary of State signed one more agreement on health, thus placing uh, Angola as a PEPFAR country, uh, improving the allocation of funds from seven to $17 million, which is uh, uh, very good as a uh, beginning. Also, uh, in terms of agriculture, the, there was an allocation of uh, se uh, 30, $32 million for the development of the uh, agriculture uh, uh, sector in Angola, as well as for malaria, uh, uh, the, the fighting of malaria. Uh, as I see, uh, uh, and the Cong uh, Congressman Payne referred that uh, President Obama <laughs> does more in one week than many presidents did in one year. And as, as I see that pass in terms of uh, 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 evolution, the development of relationships with Angola, I think that uh, the, the challenge will soon be at our side in terms of being able to, ma to, to make the, uh, being able to implement indeed the the, the agreements and the, uh, the, the agreements that we are uh, establishing, uh, and I will not say just for, uh, speak for Angola, but as I could exchange a little bit with some of my colleagues around, we are all facing the same problem. So we are, we are very grateful. I'm thinking that uh, definitely the, Obama administration will succeed to place back Africa on the map as a reliable partner, partner at the international uh, world and community. Uh, I, I will end by saying that uh, I always believe that uh, the United States have all the ingredients to help the world 
to be a better place for her. So I begin, uh, I, I, I will end by saying that yes, it is possible. Yes, the United States can. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador uh, Diakite. Um, you are one of the finest uh, ambassadors in the diplomatic corps. I am not Congressman Payne. <laughs> I am Bernadette Palo. Congressman Payne will be right back. Uh, I've been asked to moderate in his absence. There is a very important vote, only one. So he'll be joining us shortly. Our next speaker will be Dr. Janetta B. Cole and she's the director of the Smithsonian's National Museum of Art. She has served on the scholarly advisory board of the Smithsonian's National Museum of African Art and Culture since its inception, and she is the board chair of the Janetta B. Cole Global Diversity and Inclusion Institute and was president of Spelman College in Atlanta. Those of you who've not heard Dr. Janetta Cole speak are in for a treat. She's a dynamic and a speaker and a very accomplished woman. Thank you, Dr. Coles. Thank you, my sister Bernadette. Thank you very much. Even though the congressman was called away for a moment, I must begin my remarks by calling his name. The Honorable Donald Payne has clearly been our most consistent and clear voice in the interests of the peoples of Africa, of the diaspora, of our country and our world. The old folk where I grew up in Jacksonville, Florida, would say of the congressman that when he got on this question of the correct kind of policies that the United States should have toward Africa, he became like white on rice. Or as others might say, in the interest of diversity, like black on coal. <laughs> I want to turn to give a very special greeting to Her Excellency Diakete from Angola. It has been an unusual joy and a privilege for me to interact with you since I came into Washington, D.C. <laughs> to all of the members of the Diplomatic Corps who are here, to those who serve the people of our nation, sisters and brothers all, good morning. When I was asked to participate in this morning's session, I really struggled to see what I, an anthropologist, a longtime activist around issues involving Africa and the diaspora, I really struggled to try to find what, if anything, might be a contribution that I could make. And I decided that what I would do this morning is what I invite you to do. And that is to become somewhat introspective about your own life and your own work in relationship to that extraordinarily large, diverse, complex, and important continent called Africa. This is a moment for each of us to do that introspection. This is an unusual moment in the history, and I like to say the her story, 
of the world. I'm going to say something in just a moment and ask you to finish my sentence. It's a way of capturing just how significant is the election of Barack Obama as the President of the United States of America. I said it. I said it over and over again, including in those six states in which I campaigned for President Obama. I will say the first part, you give me the second. I never thought I would see it. <laughs> and that phrase is, was and continues to be echoed, not only in this country of ours, but around the world. And probably nowhere was a celebration as great after that in the United States as it was on that continent of Africa. I've been privileged to make two trips to the continent since I began my new position. One to Algeria and the second to Nigeria. And while I was greeted so warmly and I could sense that there was a genuine engagement with me coming closely after that engagement was and tell me about President Obama. <laughs> when I think about my own journey in relationship to Africa, the first thing that I really must do is to remind all of us of our connection. It is, after all, the only place, the only place on earth that we can claim as the place of origin of all of humanity. And because of that, I'm very fond of saying, this would be a far better world if everyone, especially white folk, would admit that they are Africans. <laughs> I grew up in the very segregated south of the United States of America. At a time when messages came to me, not only claiming my inferiority, as a black person, but claiming that I had been descended from one of the most primitive, savage places on earth. And that proof of that was simply to look at any film, any book. And if you get a hold of a, of a film about Tarzan, then you would really have the case. I can't tell you how fortunate I was to receive a counter message, a consistent counter message from my parents, from my family, from my community that spoke of that continent with pride. I was told that a young Wolof girl at about age 13 to 15 was captured in Senegal, enslaved and brought to Florida, and that I, on my maternal side, had descended from her. And the descriptions that I heard of her life and the country from which she came filled me with pride. My great-grandfather on my maternal side 
illustrated how I should feel about Africa when he, along with six other black men, founded the first insurance company in the state of Florida. But I want you to hear what he named that company. Well, first let me share with you his name, a name he had to share with many, many black men of that era. He was Abraham Lincoln Lewis. A.L. <laughs> Lewis named that company the Afro-American Industrial and Benefit Society. When I went off to graduate school, it was another important point along this journey of mine. Because I went to study with the great anthropologist, Melville J. Herskovitz, who had a message that was so counter to messages that most of us were taught about Africa. He had the chutzpah, to use a good Yiddish word, to say that black people who had been enslaved did not leave on the continent of Africa their culture, but that we brought it with us. And while we had indeed mixed it with the culture of the United States, that we still walked with much of that continent. As a young professor, I was as active as most of the folk in this room around the anti-apartheid movement. It was a critical moment for those of us who are African Americans and how well you know, Bernadette, that we were there as if it was our own liberation at stake. And it was. Because Dr. King had also taught us that an injustice anywhere is an injustice And so there we were, refusing to drink South African wines, refusing to travel to South Africa, building on college campuses simulated housing complexes where our African sisters and brothers had been forced to live. And yes, and this I remember with particular pride, pressuring university administrations to divest from South Africa. And yes, I remember well, my very first trip to the continent when as a young and I'm sure very naive graduate student I did my field work in Liberia. And you're welcome to count on your fingers to find out how old I am. <laughs> because that field work, my first trip to the continent was made in the year 1960. And I lived there until 1962. And so for me, there is unusual joy and pride in the sister president of, of Liberia, the first woman president on that continent. But I want to come now to say that never did I think that during those two presidencies at Spelman College and Bennett College for Women, that I would end up where I am. And that is as the director of the Smithsonian National Museum of African Art. 
I am not trained as a curator. I am trained as an anthropologist. But those points that I've shared with you along my journey would I hope help you to see that the most important qualifications for being the director of that museum, I think I have. The most important is to have respect for the peoples of Africa. And so today, there I am at a place, a national museum which collects, which conserves, which exhibits, which educates about the traditional and the contemporary visual arts of Africa. It is a place of extraordinary beauty. But we also hope that when you come to that museum, that you come to understand not just the exquisite beauty of African art, but that that art is lodged in, has come from, and must only be understood in relationship to the cultures of Africa. We believe that art is a great ambassador, that art can do much in the arena of cultural diplomacy. And we hope that in addition to these extraordinary policies and positions that President Obama is taking around Africa, that he will also claim with us the importance of Africa's arts. I'm going to bring closure now on my comments so that we can move to the panel by saying publicly, how many witnesses do I have? that we at the National Museum of African Art stand ready to work with Congressman Payne, with all in the Congressional Black Caucus, with all of our Congresswomen and men, with all of us, the citizens of the United States of America. We stand ready to work in the interests of a far more enlightened and just policy toward Africa. I believe that when we do this kind of work together, we win. My absolute favorite African proverb captures the idea, hear the words, when spider webs unite, they can even tie up an elephant. <laughs> Thank you, um, Dr. Coles. You can see why Spelman College thrived under her leadership. And uh, you know, the Smithsonian Museum of National Art has never had such traffic and so many people interested in it since she arrived. And it, Spelman's loss, Atlanta's loss is our gain. For the panelists who've just arrived, Congressman Payne had to vote. Um, he asked that we introduce the next panel. I thank these two powerful wom women who've really started this, this, really, this forum on a high note. Thank you very much. I want to say to Dr. Coles, I for one am proud of my African heritage that had a trace of Italy somewhere in it. So thank you very much. Um, we have a very distinguished panel and I have the honor of introducing them to you. I would like to start with someone whose name has become increasingly familiar to all of us in the United States, and that is Dr. Mohammed Ibrahim. Um, 
Dr. Ibrahim, as we know, is the founder of the Mo Ibrahim Foundation and installed the Mo Ibrahim Prize for African Leadership. Dr. Ibrahim is also the founding chairman of Satya Capital LTD, an investment company focused on opportunities in Africa. He is a global expert in mobile communications with a distinguished career in academia and business. In 1998, Dr. Ibrahim founded Celtel International, one of the most successful companies to build and operate mobile networks in Africa. Before we go any further, I want you to know that Dr. Ibrahim's contribution to democracy and good governance through this award is something that has been missing for a very long time, and I want all of you to join me in congratulating him. Let's give him a round of applause. <laughs> Next uh, on our panel, I would like to introduce someone who also needs no introduction to any of us who live in Washington, D.C., and that's Rosa Whitaker. Rosa Whitaker, the mother of Agoa, many fathers, one mother, um, is the chief executive officer of the Whitaker Group, and before launching the Whitaker Group, Rosa Whitaker served as the first ever assistant U.S. trade representative for Africa under the Bush and Clinton administration where she developed and implemented the African Growth and Opportunity Act. As a career diplomat, she served in Africa in the State Department's Office of International Energy Policy. In 2002, she was named Woman of the Year in international trade by the Women in International Trade Organization. Ladies and gentlemen, that's Rosa Whitaker, and all of us who know about AGOA know about her and her accomplishments. I would also ask that we give Ms. Whitaker a round of applause. <laughs> and uh, we also have on this panel Mr. Uh, Darius Teeter, He's acting vice president in the Department of Compact Development of the Millennium Challenge Corporation. He oversees the development of investment programs in all MCA eligible countries. He has worked with the Asian Development Bank and served as an advisor to the Indonesian Ministry of Finance. Mr. Teeter has consulted the World Bank, the United States Agency for International Development and Private Contractors. MCC, as you know, just awarded the government of Senegal over 540 million. And for that, we applaud MCC. And so, Mr. Teeter, you get the benefit of that applause as well, Mr. Teeter. May I ask our panelists to take their positions on the dais, please? Congressman Payne will be back shortly. We will begin uh, this panel, not in the order that you may have uh, panelists, but we are going to begin with uh, you, Mr. Teeter. Thank you very much. Well, I'm, I'm humbled by this august panel, um, and I will, I will try to keep my remarks be brief. Um, I guess I'll start by just outlining a little bit about MCC. The Millennium Challenge Corporation, for those of you who aren't familiar with us, we were established in 2004 as a new channel of U.S. foreign assistance with the express purpose of trying to work selectively with those governments that were implementing the right policies that we believe were the foundation for development and growth. And those are policies relating to how governments rule, good governance, the fight, for, fight against corruption, political rights, also economic freedoms and investing in people. Since uh, MCC started in 2004, I believe that we have proven ourselves to be a staunch, steadfast, and generous friend of Africa. And I think that our principles are very much consistent with those principles outlined by President Obama and Secretary of State Clinton in their recent trips to Africa. A little bit about MCC. So far, MCC has granted about $7.3 billion in five-year investment programs focused on economic growth and poverty reduction. 
Of those, over 70% are in Africa. We have 12 Af uh, active compacts throughout Africa, totaling about almost $5 billion. These programs I mentioned focus on economic growth, job creation, incomes for the poor, and poverty reduction. But we invest in homegrown and country-driven solutions to fight poverty. We signed our most recent compact, as, as was mentioned by Ms. Palo, uh, for, with Senegal for $540 million. Last year, we signed compacts with Burkina Faso in Namibia. And next year, we look forward to signing compact with Malawi. And the year after that, we're hoping to sign a compact with Zambia. In addition to compacts, we've done nine threshold programs throughout Africa for about $150 million. And these are programs designed to help countries fight corruption, improve governance, and hopefully qualify in the future for a larger MCC compact. I wanted to talk a little bit more about the principles behind MCC's partnerships. In particular, I want to focus on the word partnership because the what we provide is nothing new. It's the how we provide it. And I want to make sure there's no mistake about it. We are committed to a much more forward-thinking era of partnerships with Africa, not patronage. The term you frequently hear is that we want to provide a hand up, not a hand out. So what does that mean? Well, I think that uh, President Obama and Secretary Clinton, in their speeches uh, both in Ghana and in Kenya, laid out what we would call a, a blueprint for a constructive engagement for a new era of effective partnerships. The administration believes that Africa's future is up to Africans. Our partners with MCC are responsible for developing their own, determining their own development priorities, for designing their own investment programs, and for taking charge of implementing those programs. And I think that's an example of how the U.S. government is helping Africa help itself. We believe and we support Africa's solutions to Africa's challenges. President Obama also said that the true sign of success is not whether we are a source of perpetual aid that helps, helps people scrape by, but it's whether we are partners in building the capacity for transformational change. So what does that mean in, in real terms? For MCC, it means, as I mentioned, partnering with countries that rule justly, that invest in their people, and that provide economic freedoms. These are the preconditions for development and growth and prosperity. It means ensuring that investment programs are sustainable, that they continue to generate jobs and income in the future, long after we're gone. And it means that our partners also have responsibility. They have responsibilities to embrace partners, uh, embrace reforms as an ongoing project, to continue to work to stamp out corruption, to build stronger institutions, and to engage in all segments of their civil societies. Mutual responsibility. For MCC, that means total transparency and accountability, not just for the dollar spent, but for the results achieved. And I encourage all of you to take a look at the MCC website. I think you'll find something there that's unique in the world of foreign assistance. You will find all of the analyses of our project's economic rates of return. You will find our monitoring evaluation plans and our results targets. And when I say ours, I mean ours and our partners. You will find detailed beneficiary analysis, including gender analysis. These are the commitments that we and our partners are making to the people of Africa. And you will know, you will know whether these programs succeeded or failed in a way that you will rarely know in looking at the investments of other foreign assistance agencies. President Obama also said that the purpose of foreign assistance must be to create the conditions where it is no longer needed. For us, that means incentivizing the right policy conditions and unlocking the key bottlenecks to investment. And I think that our partner countries in Africa are becoming a magnet for the private sector, which ultimately is the, is the source of economic growth. On that note, I'd like to also note, I'd like to mention that a substantial portion of MCC assistance directly supports the expansion of trade through rehabilitation and expansion of sea and airports, road networks, improved customs administration, and direct investments in the productive sectors, and in particular, agriculture. This, I think, enables previously cut off people to participate in their local, in their regional, and their international markets. MCC is a U.S. government agency, and we work on a whole of government approach together with our partners at USAID, USDA, USTR, and other agencies. And in fact, our board is chaired by the Secretary of State 
and includes the AID administrator and the U.S. Trade Representative, amongst others. But in conclusion, I would like to just say that partnering with African countries through country-determined and country-implemented strategies to reduce growth is an example of how the MCC is implementing President Obama's vision of a new partnership with Africa. This has and will continue to define MCC's expanding program in Africa. Partnerships are grounded in mutual respect and mutual responsibility, and I believe they are redefining perceptions of Africa, delivering results that matter to the poor and opening opportunities for sustainable development. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Teeter. And next, Rosa Whitaker. Thank you very much. First, I'd just like to uh, thank my good friend Bernadette Palo for her introduction and for all that she's done. She always gives me so much credit on AGOA when she was there every step of the way. And I was in a discussion this week about the importance of Africa. And we we're just talking, and I was just in the previous weeks in Africa, about how one of the most critical elements to an, a, an effective Africa policy is not to approach it with the shallowness. And some of the African heads of state that I, were with, that I was with in New York, they were talking about their frustration when they encounter American, even American policy leaders, because they seem to just not to be able to go deep into the real causes and consequences. They haven't studied the culture. And I said, just give us some time, because that's changing. And one of the ways it's changing is because of the work of the Africa Society. Many people don't understand, and I want to make a call for more support for the Africa Society, because what Bernadette is doing is going to schools, high schools, and universities, and elementary schools all over this country, um, and teaching our young people about the importance of Africa so that we will have a leadership in America that will have a better understanding. Um, so I just wanted to just acknowledge that. I was, uh, Congressman Payne, Chairman Payne, asked me to talk about just, uh, I just want to talk a bit about the uh, global crisis. I just think that when we look at the impact of the global crisis on Africa, it is just imperative that we have a strong U.S. and global response to address the, 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 this crisis in Africa. Africa, although earlier predictions said Africa would probably not be touched because its markets were so isolated, but what we have found that Africa is at risk of being coming one of the largest casualties of this crisis. Um, and why should... Uh